Uh, I'm Matt Florell. Um, I created uh, Vici Dial uh, about 12 years ago, an uh, open source call center application in use, thousands of companies around the world. Uh, and so we do a lot of high volume phone calls. Uh, we have a hosted uh, offering where we offer companies uh, managed equipment and we provide support on it uh, running Vici Dial. Uh, and basically this is the culmination of four years of political polling, a lot of the mistakes we've made, what we've learned, uh, just polling in the state of Florida, uh, to the point where we've gotten pretty accurate results. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to how accurate uh, later on in the presentation. So uh, how did we get into this? Well, about six years ago, we had a client that was a hospital services company, uh, and they wanted to do patient dis discharge surveys. Uh, because some other companies, some other hospitals had had good success doing this and basically it consisted of you'd get a file uh, every day of the people that were discharged from the hospital the day before. You'd call them, you'd ask them, are you feeling better or worse? Um, are you taking any prescriptions? Did you have any questions? Uh, press one to talk to a live nurse now. Uh, and they found that these uh, surveys actually reduced readmittance by 30%, which is great, especially if you're looking for Medicaid ratings, Medicare ratings, that kind of thing. So um, we basically had to build a surveying platform uh, that would work with that. So uh, that's how we kind of got started down this road. Uh, and that's built into Vici Dial. Uh, of course, over this time, we've also built up a, a hosted contact center infrastructure with hundreds of servers uh, serving thousands of agents and hundreds of clients. Uh oh, guess my computer's going to sleep. Okay. Um, we also uh, had a client uh, who was a friend uh, running for local political office, kind of got us interested in this stuff. Uh, we had another client out of state working on a governor's campaign where we did a lot of various political calling and things like that. Uh, and then uh, we discovered more about the availability, or I should say the ease of availability, and how much information is in uh, the Florida public voter data. Uh, and that's kind of where we started four years ago. So uh, how do you predict elections? Um, first, you need the state-maintained public database of voters. And in Florida, that's very, a very rich piece of database that's uh, very uh, frequently updated. Uh, at least once a month, uh, we get data feeds. It uh, costs us a whopping $5. <laughs> uh, some states you're looking at, uh, and I kid you not, $130,000 for updated database feeds. I think it's either Alabama or Mississippi that has uh, extremely high costs. Here in Florida, it's five bucks per month. Uh, and this data has full demographics. Uh, it has voting history, you know, obviously not who they voted for, but uh, when they voted and how they voted, as in absentee, early voting, uh, voted on election day, that kind of thing. Uh, from that data, we can generate detailed voter demographics for the last similar election. Um, you can gather public and private data. Uh, the, the voter database actually contains millions of phone numbers linked directly to voter IDs, which is great because that's pre-validated data for you. Uh, because it also has address and uh, uh, name and things like that, you can also use private data to mix that, to match that stuff up. So we match those up. Um, there's also a certain amount of email data that we can get. A lot of the absentee processes in the various counties around Florida will also include um, in their separate data feeds, not in the voter files, but in the absentee files, you'll get the email addresses of these voters. Uh, so that gives us another avenue to go down if we can't call them. Uh, then we generate a random sample of voters to contact. We contact them, ask them questions, and we analyze the data and weight it uh, or skew that data analysis uh, and base it upon the past elections as far as turnout. So this is an example. Uh, I've changed the date, data in here, but this is an example of what we get. Uh, a lot of these fields are coded uh, where, you know, gender, M, F, U for undefined. Um, Race is a, a digit uh, one through nine. Uh, there's a code to go with it, uh, county, uh, and then the various districts, uh, state senate, state house, US Congress, those are all included in this data file for every voter. 
And then there's a separate file that actually contains the voter history for every voter. And this is kind of an example of what kind of demographics we can get out of that. Uh, this is our congressional district here in Florida, 13. Lucky number 13. Uh, you can get the political breakdown. You see it's pretty much a third uh, of each party. We've got uh, independent or no parties at 30%, Democrats at 34, and Republicans at 36. Uh, you got to have the racial breakdown. It's mostly white in my, my part of the state. Uh, gender breakdown. Uh, this is pretty universal in Florida, um, a skew to the female. Uh, there are a lot more women voters in Florida uh, by 8 to 10 in some cases, 12% in some areas. Uh, women live longer. <laughs> uh, as for the age breakdown, uh, this varies greatly depending on where you are. There's some communities in Florida that are all plus 55. Uh, but in our area, this is a pretty, pretty even mix for Florida. Uh, so this is what we would use as kind of our framework to, to weight, uh, uh, scientifically um, skew the results to uh, better conform to the makeup of this district. Uh, generating a random voter sample, we basically just use uh, a random function inside of MySQL. Uh, we'll take it out of our main database. The Florida voter database is around, I think, 13 million voters. Uh, and depending upon where we're polling uh, and who we're looking at for our, our groups to poll, we will poll based upon those specific uh, uh, parameters. In this case, this was, uh, we were pulling for a potential new congressional district uh, because of course here in Florida, um, we have issues with drawing the maps fairly and they just threw out all our maps. And so even though there's an election next, next year and we don't have the maps for them yet, um, they're redrawing the maps right now and they're supposed to be done next month. <laughs> so. That makes things for uh, uh, not only political candidates, but also pollsters a bit difficult because we don't know, it's kind of a moving target. Um, out of the asterisk part, why asterisk? Uh, well, it's, we've been using it for 12 years for all kinds of projects. Uh, it's very robust and flexible, um, probably the most robust and flexible open telephony platform out there with a very large amount of community support. Uh, of course, I wrote Vici Dial to use Asterisk as, as its core. Uh, and given our Vici Dial architecture, we can scale just by adding more servers. Uh, so if we needed to add more capacity, we could do that just by adding more servers. Uh, and it's all, it's all built in, just adding more machines. Um, how Asterisk fits into the polling, uh, the calls are placed through Asterisk uh, using Vici Dial. Uh, inbound calls also can select from the voter database that uh, Vici Dial allows it to connect to, uh, so that if a call comes in from a voter and it's tied to a voter record, we can actually log that response to that voter. Um, asterisk, we, it, it's a, basically a combination of asterisk dial plan, uh, asterisk manager interface commands, and AGI scripting that do all of the calling and the logging. Uh, that's all built into core asterisk. Uh, the IVR portion is actually asterisk dial plan generated by Vici Dial and uh, reloaded when it's changed. That's a lot more efficient than running all the polling in AGI scripts, uh, so you can get a lot more capacity out of a single machine just using native asterisk dial plan than trying to keep it all in AGIs. Uh, the system stats for what we've been running basically for the last four years, uh, we use four asterisk servers. They're all hardware, uh, no VMs, uh, quad, core CPUs, four gigs of RAM. I think a couple of them might have eight gigs of RAM. Um, combination of asterisk one, four, one, eight, and 11. Uh, we do use it as a testing platform. Uh, so it's kind of a way, and it also is a way for us to test cross compatibility between one, four, and one, eight, and one, four, and 11, and all of those combined, because there actually have been some issues over time, like using IAX connections. Uh, you have to change some of the uh, configurations so that they will work with a higher version of asterisk, whereas that configuration will work just fine from one asterisk 1.4 to another asterisk 1.4. So <clears throat> that's why we, we keep those running in that way. Um, we have one database server 
uh, the, the core of Asterisk really is the database. That's how we're able to operate in a clustered environment. The database controls everything, uh, keeps everything, uh, the state of calls, the state of agents, the state of uh, the machines, the servers, all of that's kept in the database uh, so that it's easy to have a centralized point to work from for everything. Um, but we use a dual quad core CPU, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, mega RAID, bless you, uh, hardware RAID with four SSD drives. Uh, we also have one web server. It's actually a shared web server uh, for management and PHP applications because we really don't have a high PHP application load, so it can be a shared uh, web server. Um, on the routing, uh, we actually use open SIPs. We have several open SIP servers for SIP call routing inbound and outbound on our hosted platform, and we just use that framework uh, as part of the uh, polling system. Uh, we have a blended carrier capacity of over 6,000 lines currently, uh, and this cluster can place over uh, 320,000 phone calls in a day uh, with full interactivity and no loss of audio quality. Uh, it, it probably could place more. Um, we have pushed it to the point where asterisk will crash. We've pushed it to the point where audio quality gets bad. This is kind of a safe, it's not red line. This is kind of 80% maybe. Um, I have pushed it even farther than this before on an hour by hour basis, not really across the whole day. Uh, but you, you can start to uh, noticeably have issues with uh, responsiveness and issues with audio and issues with higher probability of one of your asterisk systems crashing. Uh, our software will auto restart it, of course, but uh, you lose all the calls that it's currently on if that happens. Uh, this is just a, a quick view of our, our web-based config. Can't really see too much of it. This is, it's a step-based IVR configuration. This is standard, standard Vici dial. Uh, and this is what's used to generate the, the dial plan for each step of the IVR. By steps of the IVR, I mean each question. So if you're asked, you know, would you vote for this person or that person, or if you're undecided, this is what it looks like on the config side. Um, we do multi-level political polling with this, uh, which is a bit of a complex concept. You look at this picture of the state of Florida, it looks kind of fuzzy. <laughs> This is an overlay of three separate maps, and you'll see none of, none of the lines line up. Uh, none of the borders, none of the boundaries line up. So when we say multi-level political polling, what it really means is, let's say you have <clears throat> Jared over there, and he, he might live across the street from me, but he's in three complete, completely separate districts, but he shares a fourth district with me over here. So if we place a call to Jared and a call to me, Jared has asked the four political questions for the seats that he's in, and I'm asked the four questions for the seats I'm in, and only one of them happens to overlap. Uh, and that's how we're able to do multi-level polling uh, just with one single call. The, the system has conditional IVR steps based upon the voter record, uh, as well as the random pick, uh, which, it, this gets pretty complex, <laughs> but it's a way of, uh, let's say we have 1,000 people, and we want to contact uh, 100 of them. So we randomly select 100 from that specific district, and we flag them. And so then when the call is placed, and it sees that the flag is set, and they're in that district, it will play that prompt and try to gather a response from them. Uh, of course, it won't, it won't contact people that don't have any of them flagged, uh, but that's basically how this works. And the, <clears throat> the most races we've ever done in a single poll was 64 and it took me three days to set it up. <laughs> and it, it did work, it actually worked very well, and we just released a, a ton of poll results that year, it was in 2012, and just based upon the amount of tedious work and just the, the tremendous amount of time it took to do it, I've kind of limited it to about 10 <laughs> since then, just because it, it really is a lot of work to do that. Um, but it, it's a way that you can do uh, multi-race polling without having to call people repeatedly. You've already got them on the phone. That's enough of a, of a hurdle to pass. Ask them about everything you can while you have them on the phone. Uh, and the next question, how many people do you call? <laughs> well, the, the real answer is more and more every day. But uh, 
It depends on your tar target population. Uh, we just did a poll last night. It was a private poll for a client, uh, and we were polling primary voting Republicans only. Uh, and luckily, they are the highest contact percentage, the highest response rate of any group that we contact. Um, you need as, a third as many people to, to contact. We only had 15,000 people to contact, and we ended up with like 477 complete responses. Um, opposite to that, uh, we, and we only had to call them once on a Tuesday. Uh, we also, uh, we called Orlando, the city of Orlando, here. Uh, they're having a mayoral race, uh, a mayoral election next month. Uh, response rate was much lower. We had to call multiple times and we ended up with just over 300 responses. So uh, that kind of shows you the, the difference between those kind of uh, groups and how many you have to call uh, based upon who you're calling. Uh, the absolute minimum number of uh, responses to have a statistically significant sample is 300. Uh, that's across the board. If you get below that, you're getting into not only inaccuracy, but really high margins of error. Um, more responses equal more accurate results. That's something we have experienced time and time again. Uh, we, we typically try to start with a, a universe of 20,000 voters to call. Uh, if we're doing a statewide poll where we try to get a much larger sample, if possible, of respondents, we start with 120,000. Um, when we do a statewide poll, uh, the way we have of, of getting a proportional, geographic proportional response is to try to get 100 or 1,000 people from every one of the 120 state representative districts, um, which can, can be challenging depending on who you're trying to poll, but uh, it really gives us a, a more accurate idea of uh, what the end results are going to be instead of concentrating in geographic areas like some other uh, polling groups do. Uh, this is just an example of what our uh, live non-weighted or basically live raw results looks like. Um, this is just a screen we have running. We periodically refresh while our poll is running to make sure uh, there's nothing funny going on. Sometimes if something's configured wrong, one of these numbers will be duplicated or there will be an extra option in there that wasn't really an option being given. Uh, this is a city council election poll we did actually last week. And then this one, you really have to squint to see. This is what our scientific weighting responses look like, and I can hardly even read it from here. Basically, this takes all of the elements. You can, through this screen, you can select how you want to weight it. Uh, you can weight it based on political party, uh, race, gender, or age. Uh, if, you're, if we're doing a statewide poll, we can actually weight it based upon media market. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, if you get more responses from the Tampa Bay area or from the Orlando area, then basically those responses are worth less to account for the difference in the, the voter demographics and the demographics of the people who filled out the survey. Uh, last year, uh, it was about 11 months ago, um, we had a, a general election here in Florida and these were our results. All the green is where we picked the winner. So we did pretty well. <laughs> Uh, the one you see at the top, which is uh, yellow, that one was really weird because we predicted a tie in the, in the governor's race, which is practically impossible. We ended up only being 1% off the final, um, but that's why it's up there in yellow. Uh, the one that's down here in red uh, is actually, uh, the sample size was only 284, and this leads us to our next slide. Um, check language of voters. <laughs> This uh, was, I believe, 65% uh, Hispanic area, and we polled them in English. Um, you don't wanna do that. You're not gonna get accurate results. Um, we figured out a good, and we have done multilingual polls, um, but we, we basically threw it into a list of polls that we're doing at once. We're doing about, I think, eight at that time. Um, we didn't really, put too much analysis into it. Uh, we were doing it in partnership with a political uh, website and uh, they didn't wanna pay for Spanish. So <laughs> we ended up running with what we had, but it really ended up being a good case study for both of these two items, check the language and low sample size, low accuracy. Uh, that was the one race that we really uh, missed on. Um, but 
Then there are some other anomalies and outliers out there, like uh, in, in our home county of Pinellas County. Uh, you can have some results that are dead on to the final election results, and then another race on the exact same poll could be way off. And in this case, it was really interesting because we had two races. We were asking about governor, and we were asking about a, uh, a county commission seat. And then we were asking about a referendum. And all three questions were answered by the same exact group of respondents at the same time. And one race was 0.4% off from the final results. The second race was 1.4% off from the final results. And the referendum was 11.5%. So what that really says is these voters, when they were responding, probably hadn't made up their mind. They were maybe leaning one way and ended up switching. But on the other two races, they were set in, they were set in stone. They were definitely voting uh, how, the same way as they responded. So it's interesting to see those outliers. We see them every once in a while. but. Uh, they're, they're usually not that frequent. Um, referendums do seem to be uh, more apt to outlie because there's no person attached to them. Uh, but it's just an, an interesting thing to, to mention. And here's the next question we are asked all the time in the last several months. We polled the state of Florida. We were one of the first polls to have Trump ahead in the Republican primary in the state of Florida. He has since stayed in the lead for months. Um, how the heck is Donald Trump in the, it, it, at the top of the polls? It's mind boggling to some people. Um, you really have to understand the demographics of who is being polled. Um, primary voting Republicans are not all voters. Uh, they only make up 23% of all voters. And that is the only group being polled when you see uh, you know, Trump and Rubio and Bush and Carson and all of the others, they're, they're not, contacting everybody. They're not contacting a, a no party voter like me. They're not contacting a Democrat. They're, only con they're not even contacting most Republicans. They're only contacting Republicans who have a history of voting in primaries, which is a much smaller group. Um, so if Donald Trump were to get, say, 26% in that poll, which is a pretty common result for him recently, that translates into, into less than 6% of the voting population of Florida. So it kind of puts things in perspective. Uh, it's not that he would win a, an election necessarily, it's just that the people who choose who runs for that party uh, seem to be favoring him about 26% of the time, and that really makes up a small group. Uh, to show you how different primary voting Republicans are, here in Florida, they're basically old and white. 80% uh, are over the age of 50, and 88% are white. Uh, whereas in Florida, 52% of the voters are over the age of 50, and 65% are white. So two very different groups uh, between the two of them. Um, <clears throat> we do things a little differently than traditional pollsters. Uh, we only contact known registered voters. Uh, and we only contact matching uh, phone numbers for those registered voters. Uh, most of the other uh, political polling or even scientific polling companies out there will do random digit dialing. Uh, they will call up every valid phone number that's within their random sample and they'll ask them, are you a registered voter? So they're really having to take uh, on face value whatever that person at the end of the phone is telling them, whether it be true or not. The advantage we have is that we have their contact information. We don't need to ask if they're a registered voter. We don't need to ask if they're a Republican, a Democrat, we don't need to ask their age, their gender. Uh, we, we have filters we can put in to separate multi-registered uh, voter households, to separate multi-party registered households. If we're only doing a, a Republican primary, we can cut out houses that have a Republican and a Democrat in them. Um, all of that's built into our system. Um, we only do auto dialing, uh, and random number auto dialing is illegal. That's one of the reasons we don't do random dialing. Uh, it's also very inefficient. Um, our software does allow for manual dialing or even a combination of manual and auto dialing. In fact, we have done a couple of polls where we did some manual dialing in combination with auto dialing. Um, and some of our clients are actually traditional pollsters. There are companies out there that are using our software already uh, in combination with their own internal systems to do uh, pollster. 
Um, we craft our dialing list based upon estimated response per demographic. So we're basically forecasting, we don't need to call as many old white Republicans because they answer the phone more <laughs> and they respond more. So we craft our dialing lists around our estimated response rate. Uh, basically people under the age of 30, we try to contact everybody we can because that's an underrepresented demographic. Most of them don't have landlines. Um, Geographical proportion demographics, I kind of talked about that a little bit with the state, where we try to grab a thousand people from every state um, uh, house district to keep things proportional. Uh, in general, when we're doing just a single priest or a single district, um, usually grabbing at random uh, is enough to ensure it's statistically significant enough. Uh, most of the districts are pretty small, so that really isn't an issue. Uh, and we also craft our dialing list based upon voter history. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between a random number of dialing and a random? A random, it actually uses a random number generator to say, I'm just gonna randomly dial numbers in this area code. Uh, but it's coming from a list and it's not illegal anymore? If it's coming from a list, it's not illegal. Exactly. That's, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, Changes going forward. Uh, there's a pretty strongly documented national trend of a continuing reduction in response rate to all kinds of surveys. Uh, this is something, there was a great article, uh, I think out of the New York Times uh, early in the summer that talked about how in the 1970s, people calling, survey takers calling up could get 30 to 40% response rate, which is crazy to me thinking about it now. And they have this graph showing how the response rate is now down below 1%, um, which makes, makes a lot of sense. It's a little higher than that for us because we're calling people that have given their phone numbers to the voting registrar. So we usually get a higher contact rate than that, at least to the first question. Uh, the end response rate is usually below 1% of people that respond to all questions. Uh, but um, sometimes it's higher. Usually in, in Republican primary uh, polls, we'll get up to 3% response rate, which is actually really good. Although it has been going down over the four years we've been doing polling. Um, we've also had some su success recently in adding uh, email responses. We'll send out an email directing the voter to a website. It'll be tagged with their voter ID, coded, uh, so that then they can go to a website and fill out the, the same kind of poll. Uh, and we'll do that usually on larger polls to help augment uh, the people that typically don't have uh, landlines, the people that have cell phones that we can't call. Um, speaking of which, uh, the shrinking contact list as more people change from cell phones every day. Uh, we do have the new star here in the US. Uh, there's a company that maintains the list of people that move their landlines over to cell phones uh, and it, it keeps growing every day. And so when we, uh, when we pull a list, uh, we scrub it against that cell phone transition list uh, so that we don't call any cell phones. Uh, basically, two years ago, uh, next week, actually no, that's tomorrow, um, is when we were not able to call cell phones anymore. Uh, the TCPA, which there's another slide we're gonna go over, uh, changed the definition of the word consent uh, for anybody making phone calls uh, in 2013. So that leads into this next slide. <laughs> this is the depressing one. Uh, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. Um, 24 years ago, they created, Congress created rules for calling or texting cell phones. Uh, they created a very broad definition of the word autodialer and said that autodialers couldn't call cell phones without permission. Um, an auto dialer defi was defined as the machine with the ability to store a phone number and place a phone call. So that's anything with a redial button. <laughs> and there have been lawsuits placed and they have won based upon that very, very basic definition. Others have been thrown out. Uh, some it is really up to the judge's discretion. It's a very vague law. Um, on October, well, it was actually over the summer and it was set as the date to change on October 16th, 2013, the FCC changed their interpretation of the word permission from implicit permission to express permission. Now, implicit permission means if I've given you my phone number, 
or I've put my phone number out into the public record, that gives you the ability to call me, even if I have a cell phone. If I've called you on my cell phone, you can call me back. Um, express permission says, I have to verbally give you permission, you have to keep a recording of it, or I have to physically write down that I am granting you permission to call my cell phone. So you can see that change had some very stark changes in not only polling, but pretty much everything else. Uh, the number of TCPA lawsuits just in the six months after October 16th shot up, uh, or 2013, shot up 70%. Well, that's a civil penalty is 500 to 1500 per phone call. If you, if you listen to or watch TV late at night, you'll see, did a telemarketer call you on your cell phone? You may be entitled up to $1,500 per phone call. That's the TCPA. This 24-year-old law back when nobody had cell phones said that you couldn't call a cell phone because it was, you know, $4 a minute. Um, it, it's a very different world now, but the, they've never changed that uh, uh, definition and they haven't done anything to make it more friendly to business. But um, now, yeah, the, the civil penalty is $1,500, up to $1,500 per phone call. The FCC penalty is $16,000 per phone call or per text. Now this leads into the interesting story of the, of the Buffalo Bills that I'll tell if I have time, uh, where they, they had a uh, a texting service, Buffalo Bills football team, Buffalo, New York. They had a texting service that said, you wanna sign up for Buffalo Bills news? Go ahead, sign up, send us a text, we'll put you on the list and we'll send you two to three texts per week. So they got 20,000 or so people to sign up. And then some guy in Florida gets five text messages. And he says, hey, I could sue them. So because they breached their contract, because they sent more than two to three per week, they violated their contract and they fell under the TCPA, which meant a $16,000 fine for every text message they sent out. Uh, rather than do that, they came to a, I think it was a $3 million settlement and they closed down the texting service. So that's what you're up against with the TCPA. Uh, they're going after the big companies, they've been after Bank of America, Chase, um, another huge bank, uh, tens of millions of dollars of settlements. Uh, and they're going after smaller companies as they get to them. So it's something to be wary of no matter who you are. Um, the FCC just made it a lot more strict uh, uh, this summer with their new rulings on the TCP, TCPA. Uh, but that's something uh, that you can read about because it's 130 pages that'll make you fall asleep and depress you at the same time. Um, some other applications we've used our platform for, uh, this is a, actually, a, this was a live shot of a uh, community inbound polling uh, mechanism that we did, where we, we tied uh, the website together with the live responses that we were getting over asterisk for an IVR, uh, and actually showed the results live uh, on the website. Uh, this was for a, uh, a peer, the peer in the same, it's, it's a very big deal. <laughs> yes, it's a peer. Yes, you can fish off of it. And the, the design is very important and they spend tens of millions of dollars on it and it's the icon of the city. So they had referendums about it. Uh, lots and lots of time and effort has been spent on this pier. So uh, we put forward our platform uh, and uh, had a, a, a voice in the, the conversation. We're able to give people a way of expressing what they wanted. And that's pretty much it. These are the five websites you can go look at. Um, St. Pete Polls. Is the, is the polling organization. Um, the entire calling platform is open source. Uh, the waiting mechanism, we basically, I wrote from scratch. Uh, it's all based on statistics. Uh, you know, the, the loading of the database is all done in MySQL. Uh, just load data in file. So it's, it was really a lot of customization to get it to work with uh, Florida specifically. But uh, we've, we've been able to come up with a platform that ends up being very accurate. Uh, it really only takes about an hour to set up a poll, a simple five question poll to run, uh, and a couple hours to run the poll, and then about an hour of uh, after work to put together a report. So it's really not a very time consuming process either. Um, and we've been able to get uh, quite a varied client base doing it. And we've run at this point, I think about 250 polls uh, in the last four years. 
We only do Florida. We've had people ask outside, but uh, we're really only targeted at Florida. So. Any questions? Yeah. Of course. Uh, we, we, won't, we won't touch the active version of Asterisk because it's a mess. Never, not since 1.6. We, we swore, off, swore that off. It was a mess trying to work with 1.6. We don't even support 1.6 at all. Um, we went right from 1.4 to 1.8. Uh, and we put out a version, uh, a tarball version of, uh, one, or of 11 um, a few months ago. And we're actually running it in production on a few machines. Seems to work fine. It's a little higher load. We haven't done much uh, tweaking of you know disabling modules and things, but we got it to the point where it functions. Uh, everything within Vici Dial works inside of Asterisk 11 at this point. Uh, we'll probably start playing with Asterisk 13 after all the developers have gone on to do other things and the bug fixers have fixed everything. Um, because that's been our, that's been every time we've tested a version within a year of it being branched, it's a mess. Are there inconsistencies, there are crashes, there are problems with the manager interface. You know, there, there was, I had this great graph of asterisk 1.8 uh, where it kept reporting the channels kept going up, 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 up for like 15 minutes and then the channels would reset. And it, when I say the channels would keep going up, it would like repeat when you told it to get a channel list, it would repeat the same channel like 15 times. And then when you'd get about 15 minutes in, something would trigger, it would reset, and the number of channels would go back down to the actual number of channels, and then it would keep going up. Uh, it had a lot of issues like that. It had some issues where certain applications were broken. Uh, so we really, we're not even gonna look at 13 for probably another year. Uh, that's just how it works. Uh, we're, we don't, we don't wanna spend too much time trying to be on the cutting edge, because it's kind of, it's not worth it, because then things get changed, you know, in Asterisk 1.6, uh, 1, they had three different SIP engines. I mean, just think about that. <laughs> and then one of them ended up winning, uh, and you know, there were three different branches of 1.6, and what they eventually chose for 1.8 ended up being a, a very stable platform. But having to build everything to work in all of those engines just wastes time. So yeah, we still have hundreds of machines. We still have clients running 1.4. It's a very stable platform, it's, uh, it works well. Uh, you know, some of our clients that want more SIP compatibility go to 1.8. We've had clients requesting 11. Uh, we've put some of them on 11. Uh, they're happy. <laughs> it didn't take too long, it was a couple of weeks to, to work through the, the modifications and in the manager interface and how configurations change from 1.8 to, to 11. And I, I would anticipate it'd be pretty much the same going to 13. Uh, it's, it's there. <laughs> it works, it's very complex, it's hard to skin because of all the options. Uh, we have more and more clients that are basically launching it in a hidden window and just using the API. Uh, we have one client that's, that's built this basically monolithic uh, one step at a time type of um, CRM that exclusively uses the API. Their agents never see the agent screen and it just gives them, you know, it's got, <laughs> It's got big letters saying, you know, you do this now. Choose one of these two buttons, and then the agent will press one of the two buttons. Then it'll go to a new screen. They'll say, choose one of these three buttons. Then they'll choose one of those three buttons. And that's, you know, they go one screen at a time. It's very simplistic. Uh, and for that client, it works very well. But yeah, we're not, not really planning an overhaul of the agent interface. We've done things like uh, uh, dynamic uh, alternate language um, that we did last year. That was a big change. Uh, where you can have up to 16 languages, load them on the fly into the system. It's all data-based, you know, Japanese, English, Spanish, some kind of alternate, whatever you want. Uh, so that's one of the major changes we've made. We, we've also done some other uh, back, background, back-end things over the last year, so. We, we have, uh, you ever use the HTML option? 
that's, that's pretty much the extent of what we've done. Customers don't want to pay for pretty reports. That's kind of the answer. Uh, there are over 50 reports in Vici Dial. Uh, and anytime we have a client that says, can you do this for all of the reports? And we come back with a quote of 100 hours. And they say, no, thank you. Can you do it to this one? <laughs> and then that's what we usually end up doing. Um, there's a lot involved. Almost every report was made to a specific client's uh, parameters. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how they got to where they are. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, most of them were within a month. Well, it, it's interesting. We've actually found, that's a great question. We found the most accurate results are four weeks before the election, which is kind of confusing. But uh, I mean, it, it's, our predictions actually get less accurate the week before. And it, what's interesting about that is the response rate is lower. Because at that point in time, people are sick of getting calls because that's also when the robocalls ramp up and when the door knockers are out and when the mailers heat up. Um, but we've, we've noticed, at least in Florida, uh, in several occasions where we've pulled, you know, six months out, three months out, two, one, and then we pulled it, you know, two weeks and then like the, the day before. Uh, that four weeks or about one month always tends to be the most accurate time to, to poll people. And, and we saw that again most recently in Jacksonville uh, when we polled, I think we polled that six times. And the most accurate one was four weeks. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Bruce, uh, how long does it take for uh, one to to be okay? We're talking about the, dead, the call, not to place the call, but the dead. When should the call? Yeah, it really depends on the poll. We've, we've done polls that are one question. Uh, like we polled, there was a tiny city um, north of, or actually just west of here called Brooksville. Uh, and they have 5,000 voters. And a very, very contentious issue of red light cameras came up. And so we polled on that with one question. Uh, do you approve of or not approve of red light cameras? And that was it. Uh, and average was like 15, 20 seconds. Once they picked up, it was like 15, 20 seconds. We've done some clients' polls that were 10 questions, and some of the questions themselves were 40 seconds long. And the response rate, uh, basically, the longer the question, the lower the response rate. <laughs> so if you ask a very verbose question, or if I told you that candidate A doesn't like to butter his toast, would that influence your vote? And before I, you answer, candidate A also likes rye bread. And you know, just going on and on and on, we've had questions like that. And it's very easy to see. You could cut your response rate in half by having too long of a question that asks the person to try to remember too much before they make their decision. It's best to keep it short and sweet. Yes, <laughs> both. Uh, sometimes the clients have in mind exactly what they want to ask, and they just send us a script. Sometimes the client says, well, we want to ask about this race. Sometimes they'll have a rough draft. Sometimes if it's a horrible question, we'll go back to them and say, please reconsider. This is a horrible question. Could we change it to this? And sometimes, uh, like with the Orlando poll that we did this week, we make up the questions uh, entirely ourselves, and you know, we'll, we'll publish the results publicly with the questions that uh, they were as they were asked. You are only calling uh, uh, registered voters. Yes. Only. Yeah. It doesn't matter for which question or which poll will be. Will be only for the red light, the one for the red camera. There are only you only place calls to registered voters. Right. Excuse me. Those are the only people that uh, politicians care about. <laughs> <laughs> They may tell you otherwise, but in general, they care about votes. And really, this is done in the political uh, realm for politicians uh, to 
guide them in some way or for the public to say, yeah, the voters don't like it. We, we have done uh, resident poll, resident lists are harder to get. Um, and they, they, it doesn't mean as much. So in general, we don't typically don't do, we've only done a handful of them. Uh, but we do have the data to do that, but typically we, we try to stick to registered voters. Any other questions? Yeah? What's your experience running V2 dial on the cloud or virtual servers? Bad. <laughs> Actually, the, the, polling, the polling might not be that bad. Um, the issue with the cloud is you don't know what your neighbor's running. It's kind of, uh, I think, well, he's gone. He's not in this session. But one of the guys uh, that I work with uh, was having a conversation with a client that was running something in the polls or running something in the cloud. And he said, <clears throat> running asterisk in the cloud is kind of like you living in an apartment building. You have no control over what any of your neighbors are doing. And if your neighbor starts blaring music at 2 AM and you can't sleep, that's going to affect you. If your neighbor in the cloud starts running a very CPU intensive process and you're basically using virtualized CPUs that are oversold, that's going to affect your audio quality. Now, if you have your own cloud, then you're the manager of the apartment building and you can say who lives in the apartment building. And if you have a dedicated server that's not virtualized, that's like your house. And you can do whatever you want in your house and on the boundaries of your property and you can do whatever you want. And that's, that's kind of the analogy we like to use. The, the cloud is not as reliable. It's not as predictable. Um, and our platform we've built is kind of based around everybody has their own server. Uh, so everybody has an island. Um, there are issues in the cloud like timers that you can run into voice quality issues. Uh, and of course, you know, CPU spikes, things like that. We just had a client uh, yesterday, actually, when I was back in the office, had an issue. They were running one of their telephony machines on the cloud. And when they finally gave us access to it, uh, we, we were looking at the historical load of the server and it exactly matched what the uh, issues they were having at the exact same times. And it's because their cloud server was oversold. Uh, one of the other instances was apparently spiking at those times and their voice quality went to hell. So that's, you know, that's the trade-off you get. You get extreme flexibility and scalability and manageability with the cloud, but there are prices for that. So that's why we don't use them on our hosted platform at all. Everybody's got dedicated. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much.